Well, good evening, my brothers and sisters. I feel um, intimidated being in this building because most people think I've died already. <laughs> That happened just last year when uh, Dr. Dockery gave me the privilege of being back. I met a couple of students between the chapel and the library, and I went up to them. I'm not introverted. I went up to them and I said, um, are you new here? What are your names? And they said, uh, they told me. And then they said, and what's your name? And I said, oh, it's Greg Waybright. Ha, said one of them, like the building. <laughs> I said, yes, like, like, like the building. And, and he said, oh, we've heard that guy's dead. And I, <laughs> he was so surprised when I did chapel later that, that, that I, you know, what did Mark Twain say? Rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. And I hope that's true. Uh, so I'm intimidated being here, but I'm so honored uh, to be with all of you. Uh, I look around and I see so many who are deep, deep in my heart. And it's good to be able to be back with you. Uh, a, a, a gathering like this is a gathering that I, I love. As the introductory material says, we come from different disciplines, different denominations, different institutions. And so I've thought about what role should I play uh, in, in a gathering like this? Because I am, as you have heard, one local church pastor. Um, and because of that, I've thought about what my charge is. I'll see if I can use this moving into uh, 1980s with technology. Um, I looked at the objectives that have been given, and, and I thought two of them spoke to what a pastor should be doing. Uh, the, number two say to, says to sharpen our awareness of which questions need to be asked. I think that's always a good thing to do as we come within the academy to try to figure out which what are the questions people are asking, what tasks need to be shouldered, and what work remains. I thought, I, I'm usually the one asked questions. I'm glad if I get to ask or pose a few. I, I think the main reason maybe, though, to have a pastor is this, uh, our fourth objective, to develop clarity and direction. Oh, if that can happen, it will be almost miraculous. Clarity and direction within the evangelical theological community in order to provide both clear and public guidance. It comes back again. Clear guidance for the church. Clarity and direction. Clear and public guidance. I tell you, as one local church pastor, we need both of those because churches are being ripped apart by this issue so much so that often we'd rather just go into a uh, don't ask, don't tell. Uh, we'll bury our heads in the sand. We try not to do this. So I'm going to tell you this evening in the moments that I have um, a little bit about our local church and how we're trying to read Genesis. The church I serve in Pasadena, California is a multicultural church. We probably have 70 first languages among the people in our community. It is a multinational church. It is a multi-intergenerational church. Um, our church family, when you think about it, it is made up of Caltech scientists and Fuller Theological Seminary theologians, as well as people like men who have recently been released from the California state prisons when they ran out of money and released all the non-sexual, uh, non-violent offenders. And many have come to faith, and we've been able to baptize them. That's the kind of church I serve. It is a church made up of very successful business people. We also, in Southern California, have a lot of people in the entertainment industry. And then we also have a large number of people, because we're an urban church, who are struggling to stay out of homelessness. And sometimes those trying to make it in the entertainment industry are the same people trying to stay out of homelessness. So what should we do in a conference like this that will help us as a church to read the book of Genesis. And I, I've just decided that the best thing that I can do in the moments on the first evening, just after you've had dinner, is to tell you a few of the real stories of uh, the people in our church and then to draw a few applications for you. Uh, so I've called it True Tales of Three Parishioners. Uh, the first, uh, the man is Dr. Steve Cunningham. Uh, Steve is a scientist. Uh, he grew up in uh, a 1950s kind of traditional mainline liberal church where the people, his parents occasionally went to church, but they didn't believe in the supernatural. So that when Steve went to the university, 
Early on, he told me in his second year, he made a conscious decision to reject the notion of God and to figure out for himself how to live. Steve then went through all of his undergraduate and graduate education as a scientist, as a physicist, and then as an engineer. His PhD is in the field of theoretical solid state physics, after which he did six years of postdoc work in related sciences. Sciences, all of that, uh, continuing to confirm his thoroughgoing materialist worldview. It all culminated in Steve teaching for three years at Caltech, and in his years as a scientist, he has published well over 50 articles in scientific journals. He wanted me to tell you about that so that you would know he's a real scientist. Uh, Steve was hired away from Caltech by Hughes Aircraft, and he now works for Boeing. He designs satellites and works with their systems. In the 1980s, Steve was honored by being selected for America's astronaut program. He was scheduled to fly in 1987 as a payload specialist in a space shuttle until, if any of you are good with your history, Brad Gunlack, you should be, on January 28, 1986, the Challenger exploded. Seven astronauts were on board, died, and it ended the program he was never able to fly. Steve's life, as he tells me, continued on without any belief in God until things dramatically changed when his brother invited him to a small church in Compton, California for a special meeting. At that church, as Steve tells it, he saw a woman that he had known for a long time who for her entire life had been seriously infirm and who was healed that evening. He said it, it exploded his thinking as a scientist. He could not get it off of his mind, and he began to think that his worldview was too limited. As he began to think about a, a greater worldview, he also sensed the prompting of God's spirit. All of this is to say, Dr. Steve Can Cunningham became a fully committed follower of Jesus, and he still is. Now, my question this evening is, how do you read Genesis in a church with people like Dr. Steve Cunningham? I talked with him about that. I know he would want us to read it with an unashamed conviction that the God who made the world still is involved in the world that he made. But he wants us to read it without the arrogance that says we know more than the Bible clearly says we know about exactly how he did what he did. Now, on one side, he would not appreciate our telling him that he dare not uh, grapple honestly with what he observes in his scientific work any more than he appreciates his fellow scientists trying to tell him that the miracles that he tells them he sees in his walk with God are not real because they say, well, of course they can't be. He also wants to have our church communities actually being places where we're open to talking civilly about this issue both about what is in the Word of God and about the world that God has made. Uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Steve Cunningham heads up prayer ministries at Lake Avenue Church, and he wants me to let you know that he still experiences miracles. He thinks sometimes theologians and exegetes don't believe that anymore. Uh, parishioner number two. This is Min Lee Shigematsu. Uh, Li Min, as she was born, uh, was raised in China. Her memory was of religious people being persecuted. Uh, for her, all religion was strictly forbidden for children. Religious books of all kind were banned. Uh, the uh, underlying foundation for all of her education was Marxism and Darwinism. But Min testifies, although I had never heard about God, she now says God was beginning to work inside of me. And all of her teaching and all of her education left her heart unsettled because, as she says, she knew there had to be more to this world than just the material world. Partly, it was an issue of causation that she talks about. At a very young age, men used to ask her grandmother, uh, who is my grandma's uh, grandma's uh, grandma's? Who was the first grandma? She had this deep, unending, unrelenting intuition that there has to be some sort of uncaused cause in this universe. Alongside of that, Min was affected when both of her grandparents in a very short time died prematurely in the close extended family nature of the, of the Chinese people. 
that uh, died pre pre during her teenage years. Uh, the pain of losing loved ones led her to face the problem of death and the meaning of life. So men wrote to me. She said, I struggled greatly knowing the truth that one day death will take all of my loved ones away and it will take my life away too. And if everything ends in death, does life have any ultimate meaning? Sounds like the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> With that question in my mind and my heart, I was very unhappy. So both of those issues, causation and death, haunted her into her university years. She was a brilliant student getting into a fine Chinese university. She asks them unrelentingly in her philosophy classes and her natural science classes. One day after she had brought this up yet again in a class, a fellow student came up with a book inside a brown paper bag and simply told her, read this, I think it will address your questions, but read it in private. She went and hid away in her small home. She opened up the book and it started, in the beginning, God created. Min testifies, the first sentence in the Bible brought my heart alive and I began to feel peace. Then she read the Bible voraciously and learned that it even addressed the death issue that troubled her. That death is not the end of things. All to say, men accepted Christ into her life and was baptized at what we call our church into God's unexpected, unlikely family. Actually, she's a graduate of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School now too, and is a very fine theologian. Um, how does men want me to read the book of Genesis in our church? She wants me to read it much more often than I do. <laughs> she is convinced that Genesis 1 through 3 is the key to the continuing growth of the church in China, with most of the people there having been indoctrinated under communistic atheism or agnostic Buddhism. She points out to me that in Genesis 1 through 3, we discover the foundation for our understanding of who God is, of who we are as human beings, and of this world in which we live, both what is good about it and about what has gone wrong. And she says, I'm not sure if you agree with me, Pastor, but I, I think we even get the first ray of light about how God will eventually make all things new with that little phrase in Genesis 3.15, he, the, the serpent will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Uh, mostly, men does not want me to lose what she considers to be the main points of Genesis 1 through 3. Namely, God breaking in to the world and declaring, I am, I am the maker of all that is, and I am ready to make myself known to you in this book. Uh, by the way, um, Min translates my sermons each week into Chinese, including a, a, a recent series I did in Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, I, I did 18 hours of teaching on Genesis 1 through 3 in China just a few weeks ago, uh, first to a group of recent graduate students from some of the leading Chinese universities who are now going to be carrying the gospel into places where I, with my American passport, could never carry it then with a group of uh, CEOs and business leaders in China, because there is a major movement of God's spirit among the business community in China, and many of these were brand new believers, so some who were not believers became, and then among a group of workers, migrant workers, who are carrying the gospel into the hundreds of thousands of minority migrant people who are coming into the major cities of China. In each one of those settings, I simply want you to know that Min was right. That um, this was a beginning step to people coming to know the God who created the world. And even while I was there, I saw people come to faith. And by the way, uh, the deepest burden of Min's heart is that her aged father would come to faith in Jesus. She hopes that maybe some of you would pray for him. Uh, number three. I'll call her Anne. Anonymous. Uh, I wish I didn't have to tell you that Anne grew up in my church. <laughs> uh, 
Although I think we all know of people like Anne in every one of our churches. Anne grew up very active all the way through her high school years. Ironically, her parents loved creation science. However, she sensed that even though they loved creation science, they would not allow their views even to be questioned or you were deviating from the faith. But Anne was and is quite brilliant. She received a full scholarship to one of America's leading schools. In her science classes, in her anthropology classes, in her psychology classes, and so forth, she encountered perspectives about our world, perspectives about issues related to how cultures develop their belief systems, and perspectives about our human makeup that she felt clashed with what she had been taught about Genesis 1 through 3. Eventually, she decided that what she had been taught simply wasn't true. She'd been fed a bill of goods. And she felt like that the people in her local church would not be open to her actually wrestling with the questions that were deep in her mind. I have a relationship to her now, but she doesn't go to church very often, except for Christmas and Mother's Day. I've been wondering what, what a conference like this might do if we want to think about how can a conference like this address the questions that come up in a church? <laughs> what might help us with any of these people, and I think especially uh, of Anne? And um, I don't have as much wisdom for you as I would like to have, but I've thought of several things that I would like to pass on to you today that I think are important. <sighs> Need number one, if we're going to serve the church, I think we need academic rigor. We need to know what these texts say and what they don't say. We need to know in our church what we actually need to hold on to in order to be faithful to that word and those things that we can leave open. Our churches are being ripped apart by this issue. But we're talking about evangelical churches. And evangelical churches have as one of our characteristics that we believe that our final authority for both for what we believe and how we live is the word of God. We need to know what these texts are saying. Um, we still are going to have a hard time being able to get a voice into a world that is so polarized <laughs> that you can't even get the table on the discussion onto the table. But I am telling you, it has to start with us doing our very best biblical work. So as a pastor, I stand before you before the next two days and I affirm how we're going to launch the substance of this conference tomorrow. Um, studying these chapters uh, within their ancient Near Eastern view contexts as Dr. Uh, Averbeck and Dr. Younger are going to do. I affirm the importance of that. I, 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 am for, uh, I affirm the importance of studying these chapters within their social and biblical contexts, as Dr. Collins is going to do for us. I, I know from experience that Dr. Carson is right when he says that there is a danger when we begin reading Genesis 1 through 3 and using his imagery in too lean a fashion, as well as to rotund fashion. I don't know what that brings to your mind. Are we going to try to do it in a fit fashion? We'll have to figure that out. But I know this, that my parishioner, Min Lee, would be thrilled when she reads that he says, here's what I, I believe. Faithful reading of these chapters suggests a better way than the rotund or the too lean fashion that often takes places in our churches. For they are the seedbed of many biblical themes, Dr. Carson says, that are progressively unveiled across redemptive history. That's what, I think that's what Min was trying to say to me. She sees that. We need to be able to trace that. I think in a future conference, if I could just say it, we, we need to have even more emphasis on someone addressing these chapters with reference to their ancient literary genres. Well, what did the literature actually do? And I know that will perhaps be here. All this is to say that all of you who have come and you work so hard to help us to gain a correct understanding of Genesis 1 through 3 and interpreting them appropriately, you're serving the church well. I think sometimes pastors of larger churches like mine turn to those of you who spend so much time digging into these very important 
but difficult issues and say, oh, that has no relevance to what we're doing. I tell you, it has all the relevance in the world to what we do in the church. We must know what these t texts are saying in order to live faithfully according to them. So keep at your work. I just tell you, I thank God for you. Uh, need number two. Uh, personal humility. All right. Caltech and JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA, are in my city, Pasadena. We are loaded with scientists at Lake Avenue Church. We have everything from astronomers to seismologists and everything in between. Um, a few years ago, uh, well, some of the scientists told me that even in our church, uh, they, did, they were afraid to talk about what they were really seeing in their research. So they got into that don't ask, don't tell sort of a thing. Until a few years ago, just before we almost had an academic fist fight at a CCCU meeting a while ago about how the different schools were going to teach science, for some reason I was asked to moderate a forum on how to teach faith and science. I was told you're good at this. I said, I'm not. But I met with 11 of our scientists from the church for lunch. And at the end of the time of talking with them about how we can teach science and still be faithful to God's word, I asked them, what's the main thing that you want me to pass on to those in the Christ-centered academy who are going to gather? And they were unanimous in their response. They said that all respectable and honest science, scientists in all fields, and notice the qualifiers, if they're respectable and honest, they should have the humility to admit that they do not yet know everything they need to know, even about their own areas of expertise. They said, we all know that there have been times in our fields when people spoke with absolute certainty about one discovery, only to have to moderate that later because of another discovery. They said, we are all still learners, even in our field. Specifically, one of the things now that we talk about or some of the developments with the analysis of the human genome in recent years that has brought new evidence of uh, the, the similarities, the striking similarities between human beings and the animal kingdom. We talk together um, uh, with a scientist in population biology who are suggesting that the human race didn't rise from an original pair, but from a larger population. But as they keep saying to me, it may be that as more work is done, more discoveries are uncovered, we will see that the interpretation and application of their scientific work is a bit different from the original hypotheses. As one of the Caltech PhD students told me, even in the field of genetics, the study of the human genome cannot adequately explain how life emerged from non-life or how human life has emerged from non-human life. So those 11 LAC, Lake Avenue Church scientists who met with me at lunch one day said this. I wanted to put it up here. Just, it's not a, this is not the Bible. This is from my church people. Tell your theologian and Bible scholar friends that we will retain a measure of humility about our discoveries if they will do the same about theirs. We need personal humility. But to recognize that we're still learning. There's still much more to discover. There's a whole lot for us to talk about. And it's a whole lot more fun when we talk together, which brings me to the third. This is my phrase, intellectual hospitality. Um, I'm across the street from Fuller Seminary. I used to get together with Rich Mao, who's the president there all the time. He talked about civility. I said, that's not enough. We actually need, as Christ-centered scholars, to open up our minds and welcome ideas that might be dissenting from our own. You might say you need to do that more in church than we do, and I'll say amen, but I'm, gonna t I'm talking to you this evening, so I'll say it to you. We, we need to hear the questions like my parishioner, Anne, are asking, and then seek truth together. Uh, I'll tell you, this call to inviting, differing opinions in search of what is true is absolutely countercultural. Uh, at least it is in, in Southern California. You see, on one side, in our culture, uh, people simply don't want to avoid any kind of strenuous uh, dialogue about what is, is true in this world. We would rather simply let everybody sort of believe whatever they want to believe, because after all, truth is all 
ready, subjectively determined anyway. You know how that is. On the other hand, when you actually get somebody who will debate issues like the, this with you, they seem to, we seem to, parrot our American politicians in political campaigns that, to show our intellectual hospitality. You know what I mean by that? The welcoming of other kind of positions and other kind of thoughts means that we are desirous both of considering alternative positions, but also of advocating our own and, and challenging the other positions. It, it's, it's a quality that I really used to like in former Supreme Court Justice Antonio Scalia. Um, he was always known to you know, be quite firm, um, argue for his, his, his positions vehemently, and yet to develop friendships across the table. And uh, do you remember that he said, if you can't disagree ardently with your colleagues about some issue of law, and yet personally still be friends, get another job for goodness sakes. And I think that's true of us too. We're, we're in the uh, calling of research and, and discovering and, and learning, and we need to be able to have minds that are open to hearing people say, have you thought about it this way? And when you come and listen to one another, it is so much better. I've looked at this conference. Uh, I'm glad that we have both um, presenters and respondents in the conference. Uh, I've read a lot of what some of you who are presenting and responding have written, and I know that you don't always agree with one another. I thought, good. Uh, presenters present with clarity and conviction. Responders respond with gusto and conviction, <laughs> but always with intellectual hospitality. Where do we have an opportunity to talk about these issues and actually learn from one another? If this can be that safe sort of a place, I think we'll stretch one another. And I think this conference and what we're trying to do here will be more fruitful, and it certainly will be more interesting. <laughs> Patrick Lencioni, also not the Bible, in his uh, advantage, wrote this, when there is trust, conflict becomes nothing but the pursuit of truth, an attempt to find together the best answer to the problem. I've, I've honestly come to the point of thinking that the thing that has made us a people who are so divided from one another is that we don't deal with one another with enough respect, and we don't listen with enough to trust. And I'm praying that this will be a setting where that can happen, because God has given us two books to read. Oh, you've heard this so many times, the book of nature, his general revelation, the, the saving book of sacred, sacred scripture, special revelation. And then as our conference folder puts it so well, listen to this, in the sensationalized, polarizing, and vocationally hazardous terrain of North American culture. Oh, I live there. Honest, well-informed, humble, and open conversation on the doctrine of creation is very important for our churches. Uh, maybe we can model it here. Maybe we can provide some help to this polarized world. So I'm glad we're here to join in that conversation. May our work these days and the way that we engage in it be pleasing to God. And I pray that what happens here may bring glory to him and further his mission until people of every tribe and language and nation meet the one who made all, who created them, and loves them with an everlasting love to his glory. Thank you.